Hello, Tennessee viewers. This is David Plazas, the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network Tennessee and the Tennessean. Today I have as my special guest, Alexandra Hudson. While she doesn't live in Tennessee, she's a writer based in Indianapolis. She has written about Tennessee and her work has appeared in the Tennessean. She's a former civil servant for the Department of Education, a Novak Fellow, a Young Voices contributor for the USA Today Network, and also was the keynote speaker for the Better Angels Convention last year in 2019, which is now rebranded as Braver Angels. Alexander, how are you doing today? I'm well, thank you, David. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. I'm excited to have you. You and I have been in communication. We had mentioned before this, uh, we're recording today on May 15th. We had mentioned uh, before this, this is the first time we're actually meeting face to face. It's true. It's true. It'll have to do for now until uh, <laughs> the world uh, returns to normal. But yeah, we've been back and forth a lot uh, over the last year. So it's great to finally connect. Now, you've been writing a lot about issues of neighbors rising to the occasion and civil discourse and civility. Now we're in election year 2020. Uh, the pandemic is creating all sorts of different levels of polarization. How do you navigate through this and, and work to get your message across to a variety of people? I have been uh, doing a lot of writing. It, uh, um, you know, there's just um, there's a lot of despair uh, related to the pandemic. Obviously, uh, an unconscionable amount of pain and suffering and, and death during this time. Um, but we know from our history that times of crisis uh, uh, bring out the best and the worst in people. Uh, and and I'm writing about the examples of, of people. Um, embodying the best uh, of this American tradition of helping one another in times of need, of rising to the occasion, of of problem solving and innovating and creating in new ways when, uh, you know, it's especially evident that with a huge problem like this, a, a, a pandemic, um, that the government can't do everything to resolve all these myriad problems related to the coronavirus crisis. And so it's especially important that individuals um, jump to the occasion and 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 uh, and do it on their, their own volition. And we're seeing that all across the country. It's an encouraging um, reminder that this tradition of, is alive and well in America. And it's um, um, we we hear we see a lot of headlines these days about the death rate rising and the transmission rate rising. Um, and you know, people acting in antisocial ways, hoarding toilet paper and things like that. But there is also a story of, of hope um, and optimism that, that I'm very privileged to be able to tell in this, in this dark time in our country. Would you tell us a little bit about the Novak Fellowship, what that is for our viewers, and also uh, what your work is? Absolutely. So I have the great honor of uh, being a, no, a 2019 Novak fellow, 2019-2020 Novak fellow for my reporting on exactly the kind of themes that I was talking about. Uh, I got the award this past uh, past uh, September, and it's a fellowship for reporters and journalists to, um, it's a kind of a, an endowment, a cash award to, to support their work on some reporting endeavor over the course of a year. Um, and so even before the pandemic, my my work and my reporting was on this lesser told story of hope that, you know, we often feel like we're in uh, what is among the most divided eras in American history, um, on the brink of a civil war. But actually, what if we're on the, pre act what if we're really on the precipice of, of widespread civ civic renewal, um, where people are innovating and creating at the local level to, again, do things that the government can't do or shouldn't do. Um, and so I've, uh, I've organized um, my research around kind of broad themes, like what are broad problems that that exist in the world today that, that, that kind of Americans are concerned about, frustrated with, and, and what are people doing um, to, to resolve these problems, like in a, in a, in a time of political gridlock where um, issues like um, the, the, the rise of health care um, is not, uh, the rising costs of health care and the quality of health care. Uh, I just last week reported, uh, or just two weeks ago, had a piece in USA Today about a, uh, a doctor who quit his job at a big hospital to um, start a micro practice and to, deliver, to, to be able to deliver high quality of care to people at $30 a visit, just a flat fee, and to avoid this headache of going through insurance and deductibles and, and this, this convoluted pricing system that everyone, that is so Byzantine and no one really understands. Um, but you know, his story is really great and he's experimenting with telehealth during the pandemic because of course he can't have people at his office these days and he's not um, treating coronavirus patients. Um, but I mean, just that sort of 
ingenuity, that innovation happening where people are frustrated with the status quo and they're wanting to do things about it. And that's really the best hope that we have right now, um, hoping that, and my hope is that in, in, in our moment of political gridlock, that by empower, giving up, giving these people and their story the platform, I can both encourage people like Dr. Wong, the doctor that I was talking about, who's sort of the micro practice, um, both encourage him and his work work, but also hopefully inspire other people to say, hey, like this guy's being a part of the solution. Maybe I can too. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the, the purpose of my work uh, as a Novak fellow and my writing and the book project I'm working on, um, which is to kind of identify these stories, these these innovators at the local level and, and, and give them, give their stories a voice and a platform um, in hopes of fomenting this kind of more widespread uh, cultural renewal. Uh, I enjoyed that, that column very much, and uh, this whole notion of renewal, of renewal of uh, civic activism, of citizenship, you know, you and I have sp uh, spoken about the term civility quite a bit, you use it, I've yeah. used it quite a bit, and I, I found that, you know, not everybody likes that term, not everybody reacts well to that term, and, you know, the way that we've been thinking about it here has been really transi transitioning, that the, the spirit of it is still there, but about good citizenship, you know, what does it mean to yeah. be a good citizen today? Because for you, as, as, as you delve into this term, it, it, it's a term that appeals to some, but some people, you know, as I've learned over the years, see it as a means of silencing dissent. How, how have you reacted to those concerns? It's it's true. Um, so it's true that that people, civility is a hot topic these days. Um, it's a topic that's it's a, a word that's very often weaponized, um, you know, uh, and, and, and used conveniently. Um, you know, we see our political leaders often saying, okay, like, the person on the other side, like what they did, that was a bridge too far. That that incivility. Um, but if but if someone on my my political team is is uh, uh, in, in uncivil, it's for a greater good, so it's therefore justified. And you know, one 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 salient example of this was um, the uh, the instance of the State of the Union where Nancy Pelosi, you know, ripped up the speech. And you know, uh, for people on the on the on the um, you know Donald Trump supporters and then the Republican right were like, oh my gosh, that's beyond the pale. You know, when when very often um, they they have criticisms of civility leveled at at them as well and at the president as well. So it's often a term that's used, um, you know, conveniently and often weaponized. And you're right, people often use it uh, as, a, at a, as a way to suppress, suppress uh, civil discourse. And what's really interesting, um, uh, David, is that this, this conversation on civility is not a product of the 2016 election. It has been going on kind of since the, the dawn of our, our nation. <laughs> Um, but I mean, especially in the late '90s and early 2000s, there was there was this, there's this great article um, on Vox.com on the civility industrial complex. I really love that phrase, where there is just a series of, of pledges and think tanks and white papers and summits and initiatives done to like promote civility in Congress and our public discourse. And looking back, so the author said, you know, I'm writing as someone who was very much in the in the thick of all of these initiatives to promote civility in our politics, and she's like, I'm writing. I'm writing and I'm here to say that they failed. They all failed. <laughs> mm. And she and she's and she's leveling that same criticism that you have that you um that you voiced a second ago about civility being this thing of um of, of suppression. And so one way I've 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 thought a lot about this. Um and one approach I have to addressing this concern is I wonder if we need sort of a semantic overhaul. Like uh I wonder if uh, we, it, it would be helpful for us when we're talking about civility and, and civil discourse. I wonder if it's um, helpful to distinguish between civility and politeness. And of course they're related, but, um, but I think civility has a, a little bit more substance. It's like a deeper thing. It's not just like polishing, smoothing over like differences, like civility. And I think that, 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 you know, for, for example, um, I think that might've been one reason why all of these initiatives from, uh, the, the era of the civility industrial complex failed, you know, like that there were pledges that, that people tried to, uh, get Congress person to sign that no one no one started. And there's a group called No Labels that was created during this time. And the National In Institute for Civil Discourse that was created, it's a great organization. Um, I, I love their work, but it was created in the wake of the Gabby, Gabby Gifford shooting, uh, where that was seen as like the extreme example of, of incivility, you know, acting on violently against someone that you disagree with. Um, so, but I think that one reason why all of these initiatives um, that, that were, that arose failed um, was that they didn't, they, they, they didn't have the, the proper aim, 
you know, and in my opinion, the aim of civility uh, is to not paper over our differences. Um, like, I think that's insulting to try and minimize our differences to, to like, it, it, it kind of ignores the fact that people of all different backgrounds have earnestly held beliefs on important topics of, of, of religion, of, of philosophy, of politics, and that the goal shouldn't be to ignore them or diminish those, but, but to help us, to give us a framework to, to coexist in light of those differences and to still find ways to work together, live together, pass laws together, uh, live in community together um, in light of those differences. And I think that that's why it could be helpful to dis distinguish between politeness that again, tries to paper over, polish, smooth over these differences. That's like kind of the etymology of the word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, distinguishing that concept from uh, from civility. So that's one thing I'm kind of kind of thinking about these days. Well, I'm going to uh, take a break from this conversation to ask you a little bit about how you're coping, you know, in this time. You know, we've been, yeah. many of us have been quarantined, and even with the reopening of the economy, partially or gradually, it's still going to be a long road before we get to the point of, of some sort of normalcy. T yes. Tell us what you've been reading, what you've been watching, what you've been doing to stay healthy and well. Thank you. Uh, I love that question. Um, so my husband and I just welcomed a baby boy into the world. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Two months ago yesterday. So he's, uh, he, his name is Percival James Alexander Hudson, and we just adore him. Um, you know, parenthood changes everything. But it's certainly so we... We had him March 12th, so we went to the hospital March 12th, and we left March 14th, which is kind of like the, the few day, period of few days when the world shut down. So it's kind mm -hmm. of surreal. Like he's very much a, uh, a uh, you know, a pandemic baby. Um, and and uh, so since then, it's it's that's certainly affected our lives, like having a child, but also knowing that um, under non-pandemic circumstances, we would have more family and friends over to have met him, but it's, it's kind of been a lovely time of just the three of us, like constant time together. Um, so uh, apart from that and apart from, you know, not, maybe not getting as much sleep as we might otherwise be getting, we've been doing lots of cooking, um, new recipes, uh, lots of reading. My husband and I are reading, uh, together for the first time, cover to cover, uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America. For those of you who know this book, it's, I don't know, 2,000 pages. It's just an absolute tome. It comes in two volumes. So we're reading the Liberty Fund edition of, of, of Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which is just this like seminal work on American American life from an outside perspective of an outside observer. Um, just brimming every single paragraph is just a new radical insight that is relevant and important today. Um, you know, his skepticism of populism, his uh, his interest in American mores and, and how, um, you know, our mores are reflected, like our manners are, are the way that we embody our, our um, the way that we interact is very much uh, how we, an embodiment of our philosophical ideals as being a, 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 um, a nation founded on the idea that all men are created equal. Like that very much informs our manners and our etiquette as Americans. And he's a astute observer of that. So we've really loved um, uh, revisiting Tocqueville. I've never read it cover to cover, but studied deeply like other, you know, individual passages. Um, so that's a that's a fun, a fun project. So yeah, cooking books. Um, we're watching lots of old movies. Uh, there's this great kind of, uh, it's a type of Netflix type thing. It's called the Criterion Channel. That Hat that is all foreign films and like classic films, so lots of film noirs and some of these like classic uh, films that you can't even find anywhere else. So, mm. highly recommend mm. anyone interested in um, that needs a break from uh, uh, some of these Netflix shows. Uh, give Give Criterion Channel a uh, it's kind of a throwback, but a lot of fun. You know, it took, I'm glad that you, you referenced him because it's a, here's this Frenchman coming in 19th century America looking at this, and even at a time where France was all over the place with its politics, you know, uh -huh. Napoleon had been in power for many years before that, uh, you yes. had the French revolution before that and then of course a series of different leaders and and so you know and and, and i think back at i often when i think back to victor hugo and i think you know the miserable as well you know that was several years afterwards right but but you know just thinking about these conversations that we're having today about income inequality about representation about you know what what truly is freedom uh and yeah. we hear a lot today of that term freedom you know do i wear a mask or not do i protest yes. you know at the state legislature or not do i get a chance to work or not, you know, do you, what are your thoughts in terms of the term freedom today? I'd love to pick your brain on that a little bit. I'm sorry, you broke up. Would you mind just repeating the last part of that question? It was yeah, just sure. a little attention. Thanks. Your, your thoughts on freedom today in the public conversation. Yes. Yes. Um, I, 
so it's so interesting. We are a country that that is premised on individual freedom, individual autonomy, um, and this kind of gets back to my my theory of my theory of civility um, ties back to my I think any conversation about human humanity and, and the world today has to have a grounding in human nature. And my thinking is that we are deeply social as persons, but also deeply selfish, and those those two fundamental facets of who we are as persons are intention, you know, like our self-interested desires are not always aligned with, with living together in harmony and community. And that, that relates to, um, and that tension we see play out in so many different areas of our public discourse today, for example, free speech, like we might have a first amendment right to say whatever's on our mind, but will we have a happy marriage? Will we have many friends? If we say everything that's on our mind every second of the day, probably not. So there's this balancing act between restraining our freedoms, like self-imposed restraints on our freedoms for the sake of, of harmony, of living in community together harmoniously. Um, and, and funnily enough, I like, and that, that applies of course to, to the pandemic as well. Like these lockdown orders that, that have been, um, uh, in place across the country, they are, you know, mandated by local ordinances or, or state ordinances. Um, but no state has the capability to have militia on every corner making sure that people are in their homes. Like, A, Americans wouldn't tolerate that. B, like, it's just not a feasibility. And it's like a total, <laughs> you know, ridiculous, it's not, not a good use of, of government resources. So that that is like another example of of basically our, our system of government relying on people self-imposing limits on, on their freedom, like only like voluntarily only choosing to go out when they absolutely have to go to the grocery store. Um, you know, only seeing others when they absolutely have to, um, things like that. Or, you know, the, the, the classic example that's in the news a lot these days, unfortunately, is, is people criticizing, um, people, other people who are wearing masks. I have no idea what, like people are reading to to make them so hateful of <laughs> the of wearing of masks. Like in my mind, that is the ultimate example of self sacrifice for the sake of the other, for the sake of, of community. Because masks, the most of them, like the the masks that we're talking about, you know, the ones that are made at home, like they are not meant to protect you. They're meant to prevent transmission. They're meant to protect other people. <laughs> and so like, that's like the ultimate example. Like I mean, you might not like wearing masks. Like, you might think it looks ugly, or you might think it's hot and sweaty. Like sure, it is. But, um, you know, doing it when you're on public um, for the sake of preventing this, vi- this transmission of this horrible virus that's wreaking so much damage across the country. Um, so those are some thoughts I have on, on, on balancing restraint of freedom, um, restraint, like self-imposed restraints on our freedom for the sake of, of living in community and for the sake of living in a democracy where we have, um, we have a minimal government, like a, a, a limited government like ours depends on people self-imposing limits on their own freedoms, exactly what we were talking about. Just for our Tennessee Voices viewers, again, this is Alexandra Hudson, a Novak Fellow, a USA Today contributor uh, who worked uh, in the Department of Education. And you're watching this on Tennessean.com slash opinion, where you can catch previous episodes of Tennessee Voices. So we are at the end of our conversation, and I always ask our guests if they would leave us with a few words of wisdom uh, to help us get through this very challenging time. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know how much wisdom I have, but um, I uh, it's it's been interesting to watch our our social norms kind of change. Like my husband and I will be out for a walk, and all of a sudden we'll see someone, and they'll they'll avert their eyes and like cross the other side of the street, like as if like just making eye contact and smiling um, is is going to like transmit the virus, which of course it won't. So I guess my my bit of advice is you know this is. Uh, a very challenging moment for all of us and we can all be a part of the solution in small ways and and you know even if we can't be together physically to do what we can to build community virtually but also when we do have human interactions even if they're six feet apart like make them meaningful like smile um you know give eye contact say hello like give a kind word to your neighbor and then be be vigilant those that have the resources and the capacity to to do things for for your neighbors during this time of need do it, you know, voluntarily offer, reach out, um, send an email, use nextdoor.com or Facebook community, Facebook neighborhood groups to kind of find out where needs are and do what we can to fill them because this is a uh, very complex, uh, a very serious problem that that no single policy or person can, can remedy and, and it's important that we all proactively find ways to be a part of the solution. 
Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. May you and your family stay well and healthy. And hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person finally in the near future. Looking forward. Thanks so much, 